The U.S. was already allied with the Soviet Union, but there was another precedent for supporting communist guerrillas, a very successful precedent in Yugoslavia. Under the suggestion of Winston Churchill, Allied support had been withdrawn from the corrupt regime of Serbian General Mikhailovich and given to a communist partisan leader, Marshal Tito. Tito and his guerrillas proved to be effective allies. Service informed the State Department that a similar situation existed in China, suggesting that a change in support from the corrupt nationalists to the hard-fighting communists might help the war effort. William Donovan agreed, sending his top agents from Yugoslavia to the communist stronghold in Yan'an. In late 1944, with the D-Day invasion successfully behind them and the German armies in retreat, the U.S. began focusing even more on the war with Japan. William Donovan began working with Mao's brilliant General Chu Dei on a daring plan designed to tip the entire balance of the war. A Normandy-style invasion of Japanese-occupied China on the beaches of Shandong province. Shandong Peninsula was under the Japanese occupation, but the Chinese communists had several guerrilla bases there. And this would draw tremendous American troops and arms inflow with the Chinese communists. At this point, the Dixie mission was given a startling proposition. Mao Zedong and his second in command, Zhou Enlai, offered to go to Washington. Mao asked the Dixie mission to forward a message to President Roosevelt that he and Zhou Enlai would be willing to come either as private citizens or as Chinese representatives. They would go with or without publicity. They would fly to Washington and hope to meet President Roosevelt and make a pitch. In November 1944, John Service composed a communique for the Dixie mission sent by coded telegram to Washington, D.C. It read, the fact of our assistance to the communists would have profound and desirable political effects in China. There is no question that such a policy would be greatly welcomed by the vast majority of the Chinese people and that it would raise American prestige. By such policy, which we consider realistically accepts the facts in China, we could expect to hold the communists to our side rather than throw them into the arms of Russia. Mao Zedong prepared for an historic meeting with the American president. But other forces were already plotting to prevent this alliance. It was a conspiracy of spies that, ironically, came not from Japan, but from within the Allied forces themselves. In 1945, Nazi Germany was collapsing under the Allied onslaught. In the Pacific, American forces continued their island-hopping campaign, slowly recapturing Japanese conquered territory. But the Allies knew that it would be a long, hard fight. Japanese troops were fighting to the death instead of surrendering. Suicidal bonsai charges were causing severe Allied losses, while entrenched Japanese troops were tying up Allied forces. A proposed plan to invade the Chinese mainland was intended to cut off supply lines to the Japanese and take some pressure off the brutal island-by-island -island campaign. China and Mao's guerrillas would provide a critical launching pad for a final assault on the Japanese home islands. Mao Zedong prepared to fly to Washington to present this concept to President Roosevelt. Members of the Dixie Mission felt an alliance with the communists would have historic implications in Asia for the rest of the century. 
The mission sent a top secret telegram to Washington urging a profound shift in America's support. It read, we must not indefinitely underwrite a politically bankrupt regime. We must make a determined effort to capture politically the Chinese communists, rather than allow them to go by default wholly to the Russians. If Chang and the communists are irreconcilable, then we shall have to decide which faction we're going to support. We must keep in mind this basic consideration. Power in China is on the verge of shifting from Chang to the communists. But the American efforts for a communist-supported invasion were soon sabotaged. Not by the Japanese, but by Dai Li's nationalist spies. Naval intelligence under Milton Miles saw Donovan's plan for a Chinese land invasion as another attempt to encroach on his turf. Miles and Dai Li agreed that their enemy was not just the Japanese, but the OSS and the Dixie Mission. Any time members of the Dixie Mission made proposals, tried to forward uh, ideas advanced by Mao and Zhou for cooperative activities, the Naval Group people would not only forward to Washington these reports, but almost certainly were a back channel that forwarded these messages to Chiang Kai-shek and Dai Li. Chiang Kai-shek and Dai Li learned about it, and even before Roosevelt received the message, had sent a strong protest denouncing this proposal, ensuring its, its rejection by authorities in Washington. Yet another opponent of the plan was the new ambassador to China, Patrick Hurley. Patrick Hurley was one of the more ominous and ridiculous figures in American diplomatic history. He had been a Republican politician from Oklahoma. Hurley was looking for a foreign assignment. China was as far away from Washington as you could find. And Roosevelt eager to, in a sense, rid himself of Hurley to a degree, while giving him a prestigious post, dispatched him as a representative to China. Hurley had a passionate dislike of communism in any form. Chiang Kai-shek and Dai Li wined and dined their potential new ally, dazzling him with displays of the crack troops and new arms they had deliberately kept out of the war. Hurley became convinced that his new friend Chiang Kai-shek was China's only hope. In the spring of 1945, one of the few remaining critics, the U.S. Embassy, a junior foreign service officer, wrote a memo mildly critical of Chinese nationalist policy. Patrick J. Hurley, the ambassador, called him into his office, had him sit in front of the desk. Hurley opened the desk drawer, pulled out a gun, put it in his face and said, change that report or I'm going to shoot you. The man promptly changed the report, um, not surprisingly. Patrick Hurley learned about the planned invasion of China from Dai Li's spies. He publicly denounced John Service and the Dixie Mission, saying their support for Mao and the Communists, even in wartime, was tantamount to treason. At the same time, Chiang Kai-shek protested the American support of Mao, even going so far as to threaten to make a separate peace with Japan. Under this kind of pressure, all official support for the invasion plan was dropped. Mao's trip to Washington was abandoned, and the members of the Dixie Mission were sent home in disgrace. Mao Zedong was no longer America's ally. In August 1945, the Japanese signed an unconditional surrender. The world rejoiced at the end of World War II. But in the mountains of northwest China, Mao Zedong knew that his war was far from over. The civil war, placed on hold while China fought Japan, was about to be renewed. Mao's spies informed him that American guns and tanks were again being sent to Chiang Kai-shek's capital. And American planes were flying nationalist troops to strategic points throughout China. Mao's would-be American allies had turned against him. 
One of the last reporters in Yunnan found Mao to be surprisingly calm about this new and potentially devastating development. Mao confidently told the reporter, if I can fight Japan with these few rusty rifles, I can fight America too. Billions of dollars in U.S. aid were sent to Chiang Kai-shek. Yet the nationalist forces collapsed before Mao's armies. Corruption and fraud had bankrupted the entire country. Many of Chiang's best troops defected to join the communists. Chiang Kai-shek fled mainland China in 1949 to join the final remnant of his army on the island of Taiwan. On October 1, 1949, Mao Zedong declared the birth of the People's Republic of China. It was a China that was now violently anti-Western and anti-American. Within a year, Mao's soldiers would be shooting at American soldiers on the Korean Peninsula. In the aftermath of the communist victory, many Americans asked who lost China. The first culprits to be blamed were the members of the Dixie Mission. Senators like Joseph McCarthy claimed the Dixie Mission undermined Chiang's pro-Western nationalists, leading to a communist victory. This ended the diplomatic careers of most of the members of the Dixie Mission. At the height of the Red Scare of the 40s and 50s, John Service was even arrested for espionage. But members of the Dixie Mission were not the only suspects accused of losing China. In 1949, the Republicans in opposition raised the charge, who lost China? They had their answer. It was Harry Truman, George Marshall, Dean Acheson, little livid Democrats who coddled communists. That seemed all the explanation that was necessary. Other Americans pointed out China was never ours to lose. I don't think anyone lost China. I think the Chinese had to find their own way. But I think the whole notion that anyone or any American or any American group lost China is the height of arrogance, as if the most populous country in the world was a puppet on our string. Nobody lost China. The communists won a victory. The nationalists lost the war and the, that, that dispute remains unresolved to this day. The fate of those who served in China in World War II was often bitter. John Service was cleared of all espionage charges, but he never again held a diplomatic post. Captain Milton Miles suffered a nervous breakdown in Chongqing near the end of the war and was sent home, effectively ending naval group China. Dai Li died in a mysterious plane crash in 1946, just before the Chinese Civil War resumed. Persistent rumors said the accident was actually an assassination engineered by the communists. Chiang Kai-shek led the nationalist government in Taiwan until his death in 1975, insisting to the end that he alone was the rightful leader of China. Mao Zedong led the People's Republic from 1949 to his death in 1976. In 1972, Mao officially welcomed Richard Nixon to China re-establishing ties with the West for the first time since the communist nation's founding. Three decades after his first attempt, Mao Zedong finally met the American president. The Chinese Civil War is still not over. Missiles and threats continue to fly over the Strait of Taiwan more than half a century after the beginning of Mao and Chiang's duel for China. With roots in the Second World War, it's a stalemate that lasts to this day. A stalemate kept in place by time, lost opportunities, and the legacy of Mao's secrets.